Good morning, everyone. My name is Ron, and this is my wife, Arden, and we're so glad that you have come to worship with us this morning. We're just going to highlight a few things that are happening at the church here. So today, after the service, we invite you to stay and eat your lunch with others under the tent. If you forgot your lunch, Tim Hortons is not far away, and Pizza Pizza is actually not far on the other side as well in Huntingford, so that would be good if you went and got a big pizza for us all. And it's also a great way to get to know people, and we hope you'll plan to stay. So our next lunch under the tent will be August 27th. This Wednesday evening, the youth will meet for their fireside at the Bigham's home. You can get the full list of firesides on our website. Guys, please bring a drink to share, and the girls bring a snack. Last week was our first week of Twist and Turn Stay Camp. What a wonderful week with 38 kids. The next day camp is August 21st. Let's be in prayer for the children who will be attending and the leaders who will be sharing Christ's love with them. And don't forget about our Transformation for Generations fundraising event on Wednesday, August 30th. Please be in prayer for who you think might be interested in partnering, partnering with us on our building project. There will be a dinner under the lights in the tent on the property with a program that shares the vision of how our new ministry center can impact our community with the gospel. Time is running out to sign up. Please RSVP on our website by this Wednesday, August the 15th. There is also a need for volunteers that evening to help with setup, clean up, making desserts and decorations. Again, you can sign up online. Well, it's good to see everyone this morning. I want to just lead us in a scripture reading and prayer uh, today. And um, the psalm is Psalm 66, and after those songs, we have so much to praise God for because of the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ, and the Old Testament points to Christ, and um, the psalmist writes uh, in Psalm 66, shout for joy to God all the earth, sing the glory of his name, make his praise glorious, say to God how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down before you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us uh, into prison and laid burdens on our backs. Yet you let your people go through the fire and the water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you, vows my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. I will sacrifice fat animals to you in an offering of rams. I will offer bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth, his praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. Let's pray together. Father, we just come before you today and we thank you that you are our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you established a stronghold against our enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, O God, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made us a little lower than the angels and crowned us with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, 
all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swims the path of the seas. Lord, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Father, as we praise you through song, through the reading of a psalm, through prayer today, Father, we do thank you for all the blessings that we have. We praise you for this place that you've given to us. We look forward to your continued work in our lives as we work together and pray together to see this new building come about. And so, Father, we ask you to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine over these next few months, that you would be glorified as we give, as we pray, as we reach out to others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today, Father, I want to pray for those who maybe have heavy hearts today. We pray for uh, Nick and his family with losing his father. We just ask you would just bring uh, great um, compassion and and uh, Father, love and grace in this time to them. We pray, Father, for others in our congregation who've been in and out of hospital this last while as, as well. We pray for healing and strength. Pray for those who are dealing with different things, having tests. And we ask, oh God, that you would just be with them and that your presence would be with them in a powerful way. Lord, we pray for the people fighting fires across our land. And, um, and those that uh, have gone through so much in Hawaii. Lord, we just pray that your mercy and grace will be poured out on all these people, and especially families who've not only lost people, but the firefighters that have lo been lost in this country fighting these fires. Be with their families. We pray for our government. We pray, Father, for those in authority over us, we ask, O oh God, for those in the government who know you, that you would give them even a greater voice, we pray. Lord, we want you to do your work amongst us. Do your work in our church, in our personal lives, in our families. Father, bless us in our workplaces. And Father, as we pursue the kingdom of God in our lives, we realize that we serve a risen king, uh, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so, Father, may our lives and our actions and our attitudes all be lined up with him. And as we pray today, Father, we ask your blessing upon the children as they head out in just a few moments. Bless our youth as they're preparing for a retreat in the next while and this next week at camp as well. Thank you for our leaders, all those who served and volunteered this past week. We give you praise, Father, for what you're doing in people's lives and in the lives of children and youth, Father, who responded to your gospel this week. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, team. That was incredible. Uh, it's just so great to be outdoors and praising God with creation all around us. It's an incredible, powerful thing. Uh, we had a great week at summer camp. Man, those kids are full of energy, and uh, I was trying to keep up with them. I'm quite uh, tired, so I hope I stay awake this morning. I'm fighting a bit of a cold. They're also uh, uh, germ-infested, but uh, we had a great week. It was awesome. We're so thankful as a staff to have such great volunteers, everybody that helped out. We were just so appreciative, and it was just incredible, like just to see all those kids, almost 40 kids each and every day learning about Jesus. Just awesome. They were so happy to be there and the songs, and the actions, and it was, uh, it was a great week, and just everything just pointed towards Jesus. It was awesome. Uh, let's pray before we get into the Word. I'm, I'm Jay Nugturn, if I, I didn't mention that. I'm one of the pastors here, and let's, let's pray and then get into the Word. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for, the, for this day. Thank you so much for the beautiful sunshine, the gentle breeze, and the birds singing, and the crickets. God, it's just incredible to be with creation, praising you and thanking you for your blood. Lord, we just thank you for Jesus and for what he did for us. Thank you so much for your word. Lord, I just pray that you would be speaking to us through your word. God, this is your holy word. God, it's nothing that I can say, Lord. I just pray that your words would come through and that you would speak to people today. Open our ears to hear soften our hearts to respond to your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. As a church, we've been working through the book of Acts. It's been quite, quite a journey, and we're getting near to the end of the book. Um, 
where we, where we will be reading this morning is Acts 26. Paul has been in prison for a few years now, and he has transferred from the jail in Jerusalem to Caesarea under uh, armed guards so that people didn't kill him. There was a plan out to kill him on his, on his way, so they had extra guards there in place. And uh, Paul was transferred from Jerusalem to Caesarea, and Felix was the governor there, and he had a trial for Paul, and really he, di- he came to, to no decision. It, every, every accusation against Paul, he was accused of going against the temple, he was accused of blaspheming, he was accused of all sorts of things, and these were, were all false. Nothing stuck. And Felix believed that Paul would give him money as a bribe, so he kept him as a prisoner, but Paul never did. He never gave him money, so Paul stayed in prison for two years. And we talked about having to be patient last week. We had a family service, so all the kids were with us. We talked about having to be patient for different things. After two whole years, Festus took over as the regional governor. Festus was afraid of the Jewish leaders, so he kept Paul in prison to keep the Jewish people happy. So when the trial came about in Caesarea in Acts 25, this was last week, um, Paul says that he had done nothing wrong. So Festus wants to send him back to Jerusalem to be tried again there, and Paul's like, no way. No, not a chance. I'm not going back there. They're going to try to kill me. I appeal to Caesar. And he had a right to do that because he was a Roman citizen. So Festus says, to Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you will go. Now there was one problem. Festus was going to send Paul to Caesar, and that was Nero, who was a Caesar at this time in Rome, but he had no charges to write down for what Paul was imprisoned for. So I can imagine him sitting at his desk, looking to write this, this letter to his boss, and he wanted to get it right. I'm sure there was a lot of pressure on him, and so he's, so he's writing, so I'm sending this prisoner, Saul, formerly known as, or sorry, Paul, formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, who has been held for years on the charges of, of, okay. Then King Agrippa and Bernice happened to pay him a visit. King Agrippa II was a Jewish king. He was the Herod. He was the son of Herod Agrippa I. Imagine that who in Acts chapter 12 had James killed and had imprisoned Peter. Agrippa II's grandfather was Herod the Great, if we remember back in Matthew chapter 2. Um, he had all the baby boys under, under the age of two murdered in order to, to try to get rid of Jesus because he saw Jesus as a threat. This new king that he had heard about from the wise men that was born in Bethlehem. So Agrippa II here has a family history of hating Jesus and his followers. And King Agrippa, Agrippa essentially could only appoint high priests and was in charge of the temple. Rome was really in control. They had the real power. So he was essentially a vassal king who really didn't have much power or authority at all. And Bernice. Bernice was Agrippa's sister, as well as Drusilla's sister, who was married to Festus, uh, sorry, Felix, the previous governor. So there was this family of Agrippa and Bernice and uh, Drusilla. Agrippa and Bernice were in, a, in, an, in an incestuous relationship. And this is something that we didn't touch on last week with all the kids in, in the service. But Bernice had some other lovers. She was married to her uncle at one point. It was all strange and twisted. Sexual sin is nothing new. This has been around for a long time. But she always came back to Agrippa. And we see in the text, it's always King Agrippa and Bernice. She was always there. She was always with him. So Festus, trying to figure out what to write down as the charges against Paul, he has an idea. Maybe Agrippa can hear Paul speak and maybe he can find something for him to write to Caesar about. Agrippa agrees. He's curious. His family knows about Jesus and and their followers. And so he agrees to hear Paul speak the next day. So the next day arrives and here comes Agrippa and Bernice decked out in their fanciest clothing. It says in verse 23, they arrive with great pomp. Pomp, that's kind of a fun word. Pomp is a lot of fancy fanfare. There was a lot of curious people that wanted to see Paul. A lot of proud celebrities on that day were there to see this prisoner on trial. I'm sure it was like a red carpet event of that day. And our world knows all about pride and pomp. And the juxtaposition here is incredible. I find it really interesting. The purposeful placing of two drastically different things right next to each other. The pomp and fancy King Agrippa and Bernice and then the lowly prisoner, Paul. And yet Paul is also proud. He's not proud like Agrippa and Bernice are. He's not proud in how he's dressed or his possessions. I'm sure he was in kind of raggedy clothing. He's a prisoner, but he was proud to be a prisoner for Jesus Christ. He was proud of the gospel. Paul wrote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. 
He was not ashamed. He was proud of the gospel. These officials in their fancy suits and their wives or concubines or sisters, whatever, in their frilly dresses, they don't have the real power. The gospel has the power, the real true power, the power for salvation, the power to save people from their sins. Our real problem is our sins. The power to turn people from death to life, from darkness to light. We will see that in our passage today. And that is what Paul is really proud of. He had no problem sharing his story to connect others to God's story. God empowers us to share our story to connect others to God's story. And this is the third recorded account of Paul's conversion. It happened in Acts chapter 9. And then in Acts 22, Paul gives his account. This is the last time I preached in, uh, a month ago in July. Uh, he, he spoke before the, the mob that tried to kill him in Acts chapter 22 and again here in Acts chapter 26. So I encourage you to get a Bible in front of you, see God's word for yourself, or pull up the Bible app on your phone and let's see what God says in his word. Acts chapter 26. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. Paul was allowed to speak for himself. It was quite dramatic for him, and that it was, it was quite uh, common for orators to, hit, to stretch out their hand before they speak. But what would make it even more incredible, and what would make it even more dramatic, is that Paul was in chains that day. Something like this, I'm sure it uh, wasn't this clean and fancy. So he stretches out his hand, and maybe he can't even reach quite as far as he wants to because he's restrained because of his chains. But how dramatic would that be, reaching out, as, reaching out his hand with the, with the chains all, all uh, keeping him and restricting him. And here's what Paul says in verse, verse 2. Remember, he's in chains. Verse 2, I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today against the accusation of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Paul was happy to speak to Agrippa, even though he's in these chains, heavy chains. This isn't easy to, to speak or to put your hand out and, and speak to a crowd. He says he's happy, or in some translations it says, consider myself fortunate that he's able to do this. Even though he's completely innocent of every accusation, he didn't deserve to be in, in chains, he didn't deserve to be in prison, and yet he's still happy to speak before Agrippa. This hearing could, could have been seen as a waste of time for Paul. It's really not a real trial. It's just kind of a curiosity that they want to see Paul speak so that they can figure out what to write on, on uh, as his offenses. It's not a real trial. He, was already, he, was already, he had already been heard and he had appealed to Caesar. He could have complained that they were wasting time. Let's get on with it. Get me to Caesar. Let's go. I don't want to speak here today. I don't have to speak, but he, he chooses to. His attitude is completely shaped by his desire to share the gospel. He recognized that day with a packed house in front of him that he had a great opportunity to share Jesus Christ. I'm sure he, he must have looked around at the crowd and thought, thank you, Lord. Thank you for these chains that give me the opportunity to share you with these people. He wants to share the good news of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And that's, what, that's where his hope is, as we will see. I'm going to take it off because it's quite heavy. <laughs> Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Paul was ready. He would give an answer. And he does so with respect for these authorities. He doesn't rant against them. He doesn't say what... Uh, what I'm sure he may have been thinking. He just says, I'm happy to speak before you. And Agrippa was familiar with the Jewish customs. He was a Jew himself. Paul knows that Agrippa is a Jew who knows all the customs, the Pentateuch, the Old Testament. He's very familiar with all those things. And he says that he's an expert in them. He speaks to the, ki to the king with kindness and gentleness and respect. And Paul asks that Agrippa and the rest of the crowd listen patiently. Paul could be long-winded. We remember when Paul was preaching and the man fell asleep at about midnight and fell out of the, fell out of the window and, and was dead. I'm sure that what we have here is just a summary of what Paul said that day. He continues here in verse 4. 
My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Paul had made quite a reputation for himself. It was likely more than 20 years later that he's back in Jerusalem, and he says, people around here, they know, they remember me, they knew what I was like. They knew the zeal for God that Saul of Tarsus had. He was a legend. Nobody was more zealous for God than him. He was the most religious Pharisee there was. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He went after and killed the followers of the way. And Paul takes a little jab at his enemies here. I kind of like that. If they were willing to testify, no, they weren't willing to sp stand up and speak against him because they knew they had nothing to say. But they knew all about his past. They knew that he was zealous for God. They're afraid to stand up and speak, but they know that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And really the key to Paul's opposition is found here in verses 6 to 8. Paul knew that he was on trial because of his hope in the promise of God made to the Jewish fathers. What is that? I think he's talking about the Messiah. God had long promised to send a deliverer, a savior, a Messiah that would save the Jews. And they longed for that. This Messiah, they missed. It was Jesus because he didn't come as they had expected. The Jews wanted immediate physical deliverance from their Gentile oppressors, the Romans. And instead, Jesus came to deliver the Jews and the Gentiles and all of the world from their real great oppressor, sin, death, and Satan. God's Messiah looked a lot different than most of the waiting, expecting Jews thought or imagined. God showed up in a better way than anticipated, and most people missed it. God often does things different than we plan or expect. Paul is accused because of the hope he has in the resurrection. Now, biblical hope isn't the same as, as our hope today. You know, I hope I get a pony for Christmas, or I, I hope that um, whatever... <laughs> Right? Like it's kind of a desire, but really wishful thinking. Biblical hope is not an uncertain expectation, but biblical hope is a confident assurance and desire for something good in the future. Biblical hope is a confident assurance and desire for something good in the future. Paul's hope is in the resurrection. Why should it seem impossible for God to raise the dead? He says, nothing is impossible for God. A little interlude there from Paul, which is, which is interesting. Verse 9, Paul talks about how he had to oppose Jesus. He was so convinced that he had to oppose Jesus and his followers. He had to do many things to go against the ways. And we talk about this against the way. And Jesus said he is the way. That's why they, they said the followers of Jesus were called those of the way. Paul raged and ravaged the Christians. He did many things against Jesus and his followers in Jerusalem and in other cities. He locked up Christians, th throwing them in prisons, and cast his vote against them so that they would be put to death. Now this seems to tell us that Paul was likely a member of the Sanhedrin, the council, council of Pharisees that made decisions in Jerusalem. He ravaged the church like a wild animal ravages its prey. Paul says he punished them often and tried to get them to blaspheme to say that Jesus is not God. And this was likely the most serious crime of Paul against the Christians. While he was forgiven of this later on, I'm sure that he thought of this often, remembering the face of saints like Stephen, which shone like an angel, it says, before he was stoned to death, with Saul there giving consent and them putting their cloaks at his feet. I'm sure that Paul never forgot the way that he treated the believers before he himself believed in Jesus. Verse 12 says that Saul was in a raging fury. 
He was so convinced that he was doing what God wanted him to do, but you can't be following God and be in a rage. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Paul wrote that in Galatians 5:22, of course. And I've been convicted in this area recently. In the month of June, it's a specific month that this world celebrates. Lindsay and I have our alarm set to a local radio station and every morning we'd wake up and they kept on promoting LGBTQ plus other letters. I can't keep up. Their events and their celebrations that were going on in that month, pride about sin. And I was getting upset about it. And I changed the station and I wasn't happy. I was getting mad. I'd, I wouldn't say that I really raged, but I definitely was getting angry and upset. And then God spoke to my heart. These people are in darkness. They don't know the way. They're blinded. They need the Lord just like we all do. And rage or anger doesn't solve anything. We don't accept sin or excuse it, but we can't be filled with rage and pretend that we are doing something for God. Just like Saul here. He thought he was being zealous for God in, in a rage. People desperately need the Lord like we all do. And I had to repent of my bad attitude and get right before the Lord. In a religious rage, Saul went to other cities to kill the Christians. He went outside of Jerusalem and he was going to squash the way, put an end to the Jesus followers. But then, verse 12, In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Saul is so in a rage and he's heading to Damascus and all of a sudden Jesus appears to Paul, or Saul. So Saul and Paul are the same man, just to, just to clarify. Saul is his Jewish name and Paul is his Greek name. So, so here Paul gives his first-hand experience of how Jesus showed up in his life and changed everything. We say that a relationship with Jesus changes everything. And God empowers us to share our story, to connect others to God's story. Paul was not ashamed to share his testimony of what God did in his life. I preached last month, as I said, on Acts 22, where Paul also gave his testimony. That he, over and over again, he's willing to share his story about what God did in his life and how Jesus changed his life. Jesus appeared to him at midday in a great light, the Shekinah glory of God, brighter than the sun. Now the sun at noon in the Middle East is bright and intense. And this light was even greater than that. That's an incredible light. And a voice spoke to him, and he didn't know who it was. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now you're probably asking, what does that mean? Kicking against the goads? That was a common expression back then. It was a Greek saying that the whole crowd would likely know. And one that was uh, uh, one of today that we probably know is it's hard for you to smash your head against a brick wall. That's kind of a, a similar expression of today that we know. But back then, a young oxen was hooked up to a yoke to work a field, and they would resist it and try to buck and kick and uh, buck the yoke off its shoulders. So the farmer would go behind with a sharp stick, a goad, and goad the oxen until it learned not to resist. When it would kick, it would get hurt by the goad, so it would learn to submit. What Jesus was saying to Paul is, give up. It's stupid to fight against God. You're not going to win that battle. 
Saul must have been convicted in his heart about his actions, probably haunted by the faces of the saints like Stephen that he had murdered. Stop opposing God. By resisting God's authority, we only punish ourselves. Maybe you're opposing God in an area of your life. It's hard and painful to kick against the goads. We need to submit to God because it's foolishness to oppose Him. Who are you, Lord? Paul cries out. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. It's interesting. Jesus doubles down here. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Saul wasn't persecuting Jesus' followers. He was persecuting Jesus himself. The listeners must have been shocked at this point. Jesus appeared to you? He spoke to you? He's dead. He was hung on a cross and buried. And the soldiers were paid off to say that his body was stolen while they slept by Jesus' disciples. This is, was the lie that the crowd had believed because the, the soldiers spread that lie. But it wasn't the truth. The truth was that Jesus was resurrected. And Paul was so convinced of that, Jesus appeared to him. His life was radically transformed from that day on. Friday night, Robin invited my, myself and our three boys to go to Delaware Speedway. There was lots of smoke and roaring engines, and it was, it was awesome. It was great. The boys loved it. I loved it. But I think Robin loved it the most out of all of us. And there was a bunch of different classes that were racing around. There was different, different races. There was the bone stock, and there was a the stock V8, which are not stock at all. And then there was the outlaw class. But there was this one car in the stock V8 class that we noticed was going incredibly way faster than the rest. Now, this class, they, they had two rules. You had to be V8, and you had to do a, a lap time. They had transponders in the car, so you had to do a lap time that was 21.1 seconds or slower. So if you broke out, then you had to stop on the backside. And this one, number one black Camaro was just flying around the track. And it was passing cars like they were standing still on the back straightaway. But he went under the 21.1 second lap time so that he, was, he had to make a stop at the back. And he had to go to the back of the, back of the pack. And this, he had to work his way back up. And he was doing it again. All of a sudden, he was flying and, and he got told, no, he has to stop at the back. He did it so many times that he eventually got black flagged. He lost the race. It was interesting. And that was the heat race. And the same thing happened in the final. It was, it was weird. Why is he going so fast? And all of a sudden, he has to get sent to the back. It, it, was, it was unusual. At the end of the races, we went down to the pits, and we saw a bunch of cars getting loaded up. And we saw some of the, uh, the racers, and there was the black number one Camaro. And we walked by it, and we looked at, talked to some other drivers. The boys got to hop into a race car. They thought that was pretty cool. We got some nice pictures there. And we came back, and the driver was there, and he was t talking to people, and then he came over, and he spoke to us, and he, he was explaining. This was a brand-new car, brand-new race car, brand-new engine, and he was trying to get it dialed in and adjusted to be just right. And he was talking to us about the suspension, the front sway bar, and there was two different springs. It was interesting. But he had all these, he had all these modifications that he was looking to do, and uh, he, was, he was explaining how there was a soft spring so that when you get into the corner, the soft spring presses all the way down, then it hits the bump stop, and then all of a sudden there's a lot more pressure, up to 1,400 pounds that can be put down so that he can remain, uh, have all the tires planted and keep traction as he goes into the banked corners. It was interesting. So I said to him, so tonight really meant nothing for you? It was really just a test and tune night for you? He's like, yeah, exactly. I'm getting ready for a race next weekend. So I was like, oh, okay. So what we didn't realize was that that race didn't mean anything for him. He was, he, was, he was in that event, but he was really preparing for a different obstacle, a different challenge that was coming up. Sometimes that can be like our life. God can put us through something that we may not understand, right? We may be in a difficult, difficult time in our life, and it feels like we're getting set back. It seems like we're getting sent to the back of the pack all the time. We may not understand but maybe God is preparing us for the next challenge in our life, the next event, something different that he has for us. And we need to trust the tinkering and the changes and the modifications that he's trying to make to us. We need to have an open hood, if you will, to God to allow him to make the adjustments that are necessary so we can get the traction we need when it's difficult. We need to allow him to work on us and to change us and prepare us for what he has, has for us to do in the future. God was preparing Saul throughout his whole life. 
and he gave him a mission. We need to trust God. We need to let Jesus take the wheel of our life. And we need to have that humility and tenderness of heart that allows God to make those changes and tweaks that he wants to make in our life. Paul was going through some radical modifications in his heart and life on that road to Damascus. And God was preparing him for a mission. And Paul let Jesus take the wheel of his life. Jesus gave Paul a mission. Get up. I'm sending you to be a servant and a witness. That word send is where we get the word apostle. An apostle is a sent one. Sent by Jesus himself. Jesus sends Paul to the Gentiles to do what? To open their eyes. To turn them from darkness to life. To light, sorry. And from the power of God to the power, from the power of Satan to the power of God. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place with those who are sanctified. We, we sung all about the, the blood of Jesus. That's what he was preaching. He was preaching the blood and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that was his mission from Jesus. And that is what all followers of Jesus are to do. Go and make disciples. Verse 19, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Paul had to obey that vision. What else was he going to do? Jesus appeared to him and changed his life and gave him a mission. This sign from God, undeniable to Paul, Jesus was alive. He had to obey, and so he did. And he started right there. I love that. He started preaching right in Damascus. He didn't wait and say, well, I got to figure out my life or go to, go to seminary first and, and uh, work on everything that I need to say. No, he starts preaching right there, right in Damascus. Don't delay on your mission from God. Start right away, right where you are. Paul preached. He told them to repent and that their actions would confirm that their lives were transformed. Faith without works is dead. Not saved by their works or deeds, but saved to do the works that he has prepared for us to do. And the Jews tried to kill him for it. Acts 22 is where this happened, right? The mob tried to rip him apart. Paul was nearly ripped apart by the angry mob at the temple. But God saved him and continues to help him. And that's why he's able to stand where he is today. And then Paul points to the prophets. And the Jews were very aware of the Old Testament. Agrippo himself was, he called him an expert, right? Especially the Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah. These Jewish people, they longed for their Messiah to save them from their Gentile oppressors, as I said. King Agrippa knew all about these prophecies, so Paul points to the prophecies. There's a ton of them. Get this, Jesus fulfilled over 350 specific prophecies from the Old Testament. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, God made some promises through the prophets that only one man fully man and fully God, the Messiah, could fulfill. And that was Jesus. In the online notes, I added some prophecies. I didn't have room for it on the uh, handout, but uh, Psalm, there's a, there's a bunch of prophecies about in the Old Testament about the, the Messiah dying and resurrecting. Here's a, here's a couple of them. Psalm 1610 says this, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. And of course, the body of Jesus did not see corruption because he rose again on the third day. Psalm 22, Jesus Christ quoted Psalm 22, 1 on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then verses 16 and 18 are what Jesus experienced on the cross. His hands and his feet were pierced as he hung there. His clothes were divided among the soldiers. These were prophecies that came true when Jesus was crucified. Isaiah 53 gives detailed prophecies about Jesus' trial and execution. Verse 9 talks about the grave that Jesus was going to be buried in, that his body would be laid in there for three days, in the grave of a rich man. 
Verse 12 says that he was the Messiah and he would bear the sins of many. Daniel chapter 12 verses 2 and 3. All people will be resurrected either to life or shame, disgrace and everlasting contempt. Jonah spoke of three days in the, in the belly. Uh, what happened to Jonah, right? He was in the belly of the whale for three days. And Jesus talks about the sign of, sign of Jonah, which Jesus spoke of in Matthew, 20, Matthew 12, 38 to 41. And it was also prophesied in Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. And then finally, 1 Corinthians 15 is, all, is Paul's view of how essential the resurrection is. Just a couple verses from 1 Corinthians 15. Paul wrote, For I passed on to you the, the most important points that I received. The Messiah died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and is still alive. And he was seen by Peter, and then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though now some have died. Next, he was seen by James and by all the apostles. And finally, he was seen by me, Paul. The whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, is all about how essential the resurrection of Christ is. You can read it sometime when you get a chance. Paul was saying to the crowd that it was prophesied that Jesus would suffer and rise from the dead and proclaim light to the Jews and the Gentiles. And Festus just couldn't take it anymore. The governor interrupts him. Verse 24. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Festus assumed that Paul was insane. He had an interesting view on education, you could say. He says his great learning had driven him out of his mind. Paul was very well spoken and was obviously very intelligent and gifted by God to speak. These things of God are foolish to those who don't believe. God had not opened Festus' eyes, so of course he thought that Paul was insane. It didn't make any sense to Festus. But Paul responds in verse 25, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words, for the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Remember Paul saying all this still in chains. Paul was speaking the truth. He had just been called insane and yet he responds so gently. I'm not insane. Most excellent Festus. King Agrippa knows all about it too. Jesus is well known to him. Jesus didn't live in a corner. His death and his burial was well known to, to King Agrippa and to the crowd. Paul just has to tell him about the resurrection because he had believed the lie that Jesus was, was still dead. Paul knew that Agrippa was aware of Jesus. So Paul goes again back to the prophets. Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? No answer. Paul kind of had him stuck there. If he said, yes, I do believe in the prophets, then he'd be agreeing with Paul. And if he said, no, I don't believe the prophets, then the Jewish leaders would be really upset at him then he'd be really in trouble. Paul knew that Agrippa believed the prophets. I know you believe the prophets, he says. Paul pushes Agrippa to make a decision. You believe in the prophets and, and Jesus is prophesied. As believers, we present the truth, we present the gospel, and then we prompt a response. What is keeping you from becoming a Christian, we can say after we have shared. Agrippa responds, and there's a few, way to, few ways to translate this response. In the uh, New King James Version, I believe it is, it says, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. I think it's, it's a defense mechanism here by Agrippa. I think it might be some sarcasm. In a short time, would you convince me to be a Christian? Are you trying to convert me, Paul? Might be a great way to translate that. Really, Agrippa hits the nail on the head. Paul's bold response, yes, of course I want to convert you. I want to convert everybody here, right? I am trying to convert you. I want everyone to here to follow Jesus like I do because he is alive 
and because he is God. He is the Messiah that has been long promised. And I don't care if it takes a short time today or a long time. I want everyone here to become like me, except for these chains. Isn't it ironic that the only one in chains was, the, was Paul, who was the only one there that day, likely, who was actually free from the chains of sin. Jesus offers freedom from our sins and our guilt because he lived a sinless life. He died on the cross. He paid the debt that we couldn't pay to satisfy the wrath of God. And he rose again, having power over sin and death. And God offers freedom to you today from your sins, from your, the chains and bondage that you are in. If you admit that you're a sinner, believe in Jesus Christ and call on him to save you. And then you can be truly free from the chains of sin and death and separation from God. Verse 30. Then the king arose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to, to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. The governors and the leaders, they realized that Paul was innocent. He shouldn't have been in those chains. Paul had honored the temple instead of profaning it. He was speaking the fulfillment of the law instead of breaking it. And he was giving the highest glory to God instead of blaspheming God. But they had to send him to Rome. He could have been let go, but he appealed to Caesar, so he's got to go to Rome. To Caesar, he has appealed. To Caesar, he will go. So what does this chapter say to us today? Well, I think there's a few questions that have jumped out at me this week. Number one, I think we need to ask ourselves, are we in spiritual chains? Are you enslaved to sin? We all have a master. None of us are free to live on our own. We may be deceived in thinking that, but really, either the devil is your master and you are stuck in your sin and your guilt, or you are a slave to God, a good master who gives you freedom and life and a relationship with him. Number two, I think we need to ask ourselves, if we are free from sin, if we are free from those chains, are we ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you? Paul was so ready and so prepared and just looking to, to share his story. Paul was given a mission from Jesus to open people's eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, to tell people that they can have forgiveness of sins and a relationship with Jesus that changes everything. So we shared what God did in his life over and over again. He just kept sharing what Jesus had, how Jesus had changed him. He told his story with boldness, even when it could have gotten him killed. People could see the powerful transformation that God had done in his life. Are you sharing your story? Are you telling those around you of how God has changed you? And if God hasn't changed you, maybe we really need to take a heart check. See, God empowers us to share our story, to connect others to God's story. We might get nervous talking to other people about the Lord, but God gives us the words that, he need, that we need to say. The Bible is God's story of redemption. Over and over again, God wants to bring people back to himself through faith in Jesus Christ. Third question is, are you kicking against the goads today? Don't fight against God. Resisting him is foolishness. We need to give in and submit. He loves us and he knows what is best for us. At Fireside this past week with the youth, we looked at Psalm 51. And it's a powerful psalm where King David, when he's confronted about his sin with Bathsheba, is repentant. Have mercy on me, Lord. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Forgive me of my sin against you and you alone. We need to have a tender heart like that. And I think that's why David was known as a man after God's own heart. It's not because he was perfect. He made a lot of mistakes. He was a sinner. But when he was confronted, he had a heart that responded to that conviction from the Lord. Do you have an open hood for God to make the changes, the modifications that are necessary? What is God speaking to you about today? Is there something in your life that you need him to change? We need to submit to him and follow his leading. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the example that we have of Paul. He wasn't afraid to tell his story of how Jesus changed his life so dramatically. He submitted to you and he obeyed and faithfully followed the mission that you gave him. Help us to submit to your spirit today. Whatever it is that you are poking at in our life, help us to obey and give in rather than kick against the goads. You are the all-powerful, all-knowing, unchanging God, and we are humbled and honored that you choose to speak to us. Let us listen and obey. Help us share our stories to connect others to your story. In Jesus' name, amen. The Holy Spirit is the one that leads us, and Paul was definitely led by the Holy Spirit. And So whatever God is speaking to you today, I just urge you to respond. Don't be like Agrippa and, and say, you know, you almost convinced me. You know, give in to God. Don't kick against the goads. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us and speaks to us. Lord, give us a responsive heart, a tender heart, an open hood that's willing to make changes that you want to make in our, in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, bless us as we go, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Have a great week.